Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas E. Golden Jr. Fellowship in Faith and Science. A special welcome to the family members of Tom Golden who are joining us via live stream. Following the presentation tonight, there will be time for questions and answers. Please come forward to the microphone and just ask brief questions. Dr. Stephen M. Barr is Professor Emeritus of Physics at the University of Delaware and former director of its Bartol Research Institute. He received his PhD in theoretical particle physics from Princeton University in 1978. He went on to do research at the University of Pennsylvania as a postdoc fellow, the University of Washington as a research assistant professor, and Brookhaven National Laboratory as an associate scientist before joining the faculty of the University of Delaware in 1987. His physics research centers mainly on grand unified theories, the cosmology of the early universe, including the origin of matter and dark matter, and the properties of fundamental particles. Dr. Barr writes and lectures extensively on the relationship of science and religion. Many of his articles and reviews have appeared in First Things, and he has also written for National Review, The Public Interest, Commonweal, The Wall Street Journal, and other national publications. He is the author of The Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, A Student's Guide to Natural Science, Science and Religion, The Myth of Conflict, and The Believing Scientist, Essays on Science and Religion. Dr. Barr received the Benjamin Terry, sorry, 
<laughs> Benemerenti Medal from Pope Benedict XVI. He is the first president of the Catholic Society of Catholic Scientists, which he and a group of colleagues founded in June of 2016, and which has grown to 1,700 members. He and his wife Kathleen have five grown children. Please welcome me, help me to welcome Dr. Barr as he addresses the topic, science and religion, the myth of conflict. Welcome. <laughs> Ah, thank you, uh, Sister Jen, and uh, <clears throat> thank you all for coming out to, uh, to uh, hear this talk. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is this fine? Okay, good. So before I start, I always like to ask, how many people know who that uh, priest standing with Einstein is? Raise your hand if you know who that is. Ah, okay, so some of you will learn something new tonight. <laughs> At least one thing. So many people think uh, that there's a conflict between science and faith and science and religion. I'm sure most of you are aware of this, and maybe that's why you have come to this talk. When people find out that I am a scientist and am religious, they sometimes ask me whether I find any difficulty reconciling the two. Um, I've always found that a strange question, and many of my Catholic scientist friends find that strange question also. I'm a scientist for many of the same reasons that I am religious, a sense of wonder, a passionate desire to know the reason behind things, and a belief that there is a reason behind things, and a deep conviction that everything holds together in some coherent way. For me, both the Catholic faith and empirical science, modern science, make sense of the world. Science tells us about the things that we can observe and measure, but religion has a much wider scope and answers deeper questions. Questions about the ultimate cause of the universe, of the world's existence and order. The purpose of human life and our ultimate destiny. It tells us about spiritual realities, about God and man, love and truth, good and evil, sin and redemption. The Catholic faith and empirical science are two perspectives on reality. They see things in different ways, but not necessarily conflicting ways. Now, I've been a Catholic for 68 years and a scientist for over 44 years, and I know of no scientific fact that conflicts with any Catholic doctrine. So why do many people think that science and religion are inherently at odds with each other? There are several reasons. Some people have misconceptions about science and what it dis has discovered. Many people have misconceptions about what various religions actually teach. This is certainly true of Catholicism. Not even all Catholics have an accurate understanding, a knowledge of what their own faith teaches. Some people just lump all religion together in an undifferentiated mass. Every example of superstitious beliefs or magical practices that they come across is evidence to them of the irrationality of all religion. A very common error, many of the so-called new atheists make it, is a failure to distinguish between science itself and a certain philosophy that is often called scientific materialism. What is scientific materialism? Well, materialism is the idea that all reality is reducible to matter and its behavior. Scientific materialists are people who think that this is somehow implied, that materialism is somehow implied by modern science. This is an opinion that is held by many scientists and by people, many people who claim to speak in the name of science. But it has no claim to being science. It is, as I said, a philosophical opinion. Now, if matter were the only reality, then of course God would not exist because God is not a material entity, but nor, nor would human spiritual souls. A human being would be nothing more than a complex structure made of atoms, and everything about a human being would be explicable, ultimately, in terms of the laws of physics that govern how those atoms move. 
In other words, scientific materialism implies not just that God does not exist, but that, strictly speaking, you don't exist either, at least not in the way that you thought you did. The popular science writer and astronomer, Carl Sagan, put it this way in one of his books. He said, I am a collection of water, calcium, and organic molecules called Carl Sagan. <laughs> and Francis, he was a lot more than that. <laughs> Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, wrote, you, your joys and your, uh, and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. Now, for some of its adherents, scientific materialism is just a philosophical opinion, but for some it's more than that. It's a passionately held ideology that sees science as having a saving mission. That mission is to free the human mind from irrationality and superstition in all its forms. And among, and among superstition and irrationality, they count religion, all religion. For such people, it's not enough that science is good and brings us understanding of the world. There must be an enemy to be vanquished, and they cast religion in that role. This explains the strange, I think, the strange zeal that some materialists, like Richard Dawkins, for example, have in propagating their ideas. They feel they're taking part in a grand struggle between reason and its enemies. Now, those who say that science and faith are in conflict have three kinds of arguments, philosophical, historical, and scientific. Their philosophical claim is that there is an inherent contradiction between the scientific and religious outlooks. Science is based on reason and evidence, whereas religion, they say, is irrational because it's based on dogma, faith, and mystery, which involve belief in things that cannot be seen and for which supposedly there's no evidence. Science is based on natural explanations and natural laws, whereas religion is based on, the, on miracles and the supernatural. They see religion as a matter of myth and magic and therefore the very antithesis of a rational scientific outlook. Their historical claim is that religious believers and institutions have been hostile to science and tried to suppress it. This is powerfully symbolized in the eyes of many by the Catholic Church's treatment of Galileo 400 years ago. And this impression is constantly being reinforced in the public mind by the never-ending battle against evolution waged by fundamentalist Christians. The materialist scientific claim is that the actual discoveries of modern science over the last 400 years have debunked or undermined basic Christian beliefs about the universe and humanity's place in it. As the story is often told, science has dealt one blow after another to the religious conception of the world. Copernicus showed that Mankind is not the center of the universe. Newtonian physics showed that nature has no purposes or goals, but is purely mechanical and governed by blind and impersonal forces. Modern astronomy showed how small and insignificant we are compared to the cosmos as a whole. Darwin, some say, showed that human life is an accident and that human beings differ only in degree and not in kind from lower animals. Advances in neuroscience and artificial intelligence are thought to be demonstrating that the supposed soul is nothing but the working of the brain, a complex biochemical computer. And modern cosmology is invoked to show either that the universe had no beginning or that the universe created itself out of nothing by a quantum fluctuation. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the materialist, philosophical, and historical claim that religion 
and Christianity in particular, are inherently contrary to science and historically have been its enemies. In the last part, I will discuss some of the things modern physics has discovered and argue that they're more consistent, more consonant with what Christians and other theists believe than with materialism and atheism. So let's begin with the opposition between the supernaturalism of religion and the naturalism of science. It's certainly true that biblical religion and most other religions involve belief in supernatural entities and events. However, the biblical religions never have been based on supernaturalism if we mean by that a rejection of the idea that there is a natural order and that there are natural phenomena with natural causes. In fact, scholars tell us that the book of Genesis was in part a polemic against the supernaturalism and superstition of ancient pagan religion. When Genesis said that the sun and moon were merely lamps placed by God in the heavens to light the day and the night, it was attacking pagan religions that worshipped the sun and moon as deities. When Genesis said that man was made in the image of God and is to exercise dominion over the animals, Genesis was, among other things, attacking the pagan religions in which human beings worshipped and bowed down to animals or to gods made in the image of animals. In paganism, the world was filled with occult forces and populated by numerous deities, gods and goddesses of the oceans and forests of wind and fire and lightning of sex and fertility and, and so on of everything. Jews and Christians, however, taught that there was only one God who was to be sought not within nature, not within its phenomena and forces, but outside of nature, a God who was indeed, who is indeed, the author of nature. In this way, biblical religion stripped the physical universe of divinity and made it into a natural world no longer the abode of gods, but the creation, merely the creation of God. And since God is good, the natural world was seen as something good and worth studying. And since God is intelligent and wise, the world he made must reflect this. It must therefore have been made according to principles and laws that can be discovered and understood by reason. Biblical religion then taught that there is a natural order which comes from God. And what characterizes this natural order and reflects the rationality of its creator is precisely that it is orderly, harmonious, and lawful. Consider this passage from the letter of Clement to the church in Corinth, written in about 97 AD. St. Clement was, the bishop of, was a bishop of Rome, listed in ancient documents as the third after St. Peter. He wrote, the heavens, as they revolve beneath his government, do so in quiet submission to him. The day and the night run the course he has laid down for them. Sun, moon, and the starry choirs roll on in harmony at his command, none swerving from its appointed orbit. Laws of the same kind sustain the fathomless deeps of the abyss and the untold regions of the netherworld. The impassable ocean and all the worlds that lie beyond it are themselves ruled by the like ordinances of the Lord. Upon all of these, the great architect and Lord of the universe has enjoined peace and harmony. Or consider this passage from the Christian author Minucius Felix, writing around 200 AD. He's trying to convince his pagan contemporaries to believe in a creator God. And he says, if upon entering some home, you saw that everything there was well tended, neat and decorative, you would believe that some master was in charge of it and that he was himself much superior to those good things. 
So too, in the home of this world, when you see providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth, believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe, more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. Look at what these passages point to as evidence of God, not to supernatural phenomena or miraculous departures from the order of nature, but to the order of nature itself. This was actually the standard argument given by ancient Christians for believing in a creator God. This and the very fact that there is a universe at all. The arguments for a, create, the arguments for a creator taken from the physical universe were two. There must be a cause of the universe's existence and a cause of its order. Allow me to cite several, in fact seven or eight, early Christian writers to show this. So St. Gregory of Nazianzus in the late fourth century wrote, let us even suppose that the existence of the world is spontaneous. To what will you ascribe its order? Or Origen, writing around 250 AD, says, when we are convinced by what we see in the excellent orderliness of the world, then we worship its maker as the one author of one effect, which, since it is entirely in harmony with itself, cannot therefore have been the work of many makers. Lactantius, writing about 300 AD, says, there is no one so uncivilized nor of such barbarous manners that he does not, when he raises his eyes to heaven, understand something from the very magnitude of things, their motion, arrangement, constancy, beauty, and proportion, and that this could not possibly be if it were not established in wonderful order, having been fashioned on some greater design. St. Athanasius, writing shortly after that, says, creation as if in written characters and by means of its order and harmony, declares in a loud voice its own master and creator. He goes on to say, God, by his own word, gave to creation such order as is found therein, so that though he is by nature invisible, men might be able to know him through his works. St. Gregory of Nyssa, writing in the late fourth century, says, all creation, and above all, as the scripture says, the orderly arrangement of the heavens demonstrates the wisdom of the creator through the skill displayed in his works. And finally, St. Cyril of Alexandria, writing in the mid-fifth century, says, from the origination of the world, that is, from its existence, and from its order and beauty, we can recognize that the wisdom and power of him who created it and brought it into existence far surpasses every created mind. Moreover, this orderliness of nature is a lawful order. And if there is a law, there must be a lawgiver. God was the lawgiver not only to Israel, but to the cosmos itself. God says in Jeremiah 33:25, "When I have no covenant with day and night, and have given no laws to heaven and earth, then too will I reject the descendants of Jacob and of my servant David. Psalm 148 tells of God establishing the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavens by a decree or law. The very concept of laws of physics has Christian roots. It comes from two great scientists of the 1600s, Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton, who based the idea on, who based the idea on the, uh, the idea that God imposed laws on the material world. Some atheists concede this. For example, the eminent biologist Edward O. Wilson, who died quite recently, suggested the following as the reason that ancient Chinese civilization, for all of its impressive scientific achievements, did not produce a Newton or a Descartes. He said, why no Newton or Descartes? Why no Descartes or Newton? Their scholars had abandoned the idea of a supreme being with personal and creative properties. No rational author of nature existed for them. 
Consequently, the objects they meticulously described did not follow universal principles. In the absence of a compelling need for the notion of general laws, thoughts in the mind of God, so to speak, little or no search was made for them. The well-known cosmologist, Andre Linde, who is also an atheist, at least not a theist, has suggested that the notion of a universe governed, quote, by a single law in all its parts is historically rooted in monotheism. Now, the biblical religions do, of course, teach that there are supernatural realities that have effects in the world. For example, divine grace. But the word supernatural, which means above the natural, would make no sense unless there were a natural order in the first place. And the concept of miracles, which are extraordinary events that go beyond what is naturally possible, presupposes that there is a natural order that determines what is naturally possible and what isn't. There's no logical contradiction between the idea of miracles and the idea of a lawful universe. For the same lawgiver who established the laws of nature can also suspend or override or make exceptions to them. Because he made the rules, he can make exceptions to them for the sake of some greater purpose. And as we shall see, the man who led the development of modern science in its first few centuries, the pioneers in uncovering nature's laws, such as Isaac Newton, were almost all devout Christians who believed in miracles. Now there's a lot of confusion today, even among religious believers, about how nature relates to God. Instead of seeing God as the author of nature, they see God and nature as somehow opposed or in competition with each other. So that if something has a natural explanation, then God has nothing to do with it. And if God is the cause of something, then it must be supernatural. Many, therefore, look for evidence of God only in what is outside the course of nature or inexplicable by science. That is, in the gaps in our scientific understanding. Hence the expression, the God of the gaps. And atheists think that by closing those gaps, they'll leave no place for God to hide. The traditional Christian view is quite different. If God, as creator of the natural world, established its laws and gave things their natural powers, then his existence is evident in nature itself and its ordinary processes. Medieval theologians distinguished two ways in which God acts in the world. He can act directly in a supernatural manner, for example, turning water into wine, or he can accomplish his will through the operation of natural causes and processes, which in the terminology of theology are called secondary causes. It has always been the Christian view that God ordinarily acts through natural secondary causes. In the words of the great theologian Francisco Suarez, who died about 400 years ago, quote, God does not interfere directly with the natural order where secondary causes suffice to produce the intended effect, unquote. This principle was important for the founding of science, for it implied that when confronted by some puzzling event or new phenomenon, we should look first for natural explanations. Superstitious people tend to look, tend to see the supernatural in every unusual or strange event. But this was criticized by the great medieval scientist and theologian, Nicholas Oresme. In explaining the marvels of nature, he said, quote, there's no reason to take recourse to the heavens or to demons or to our glorious God, as if he would produce these effects directly, any more than he directly produces those effects whose natural causes we believe are well known to us. 
Another great medieval scientist and philosopher, Jean Buridan, wrote, the, philosoph the philosophers, which in those days included what we would call scientists, the philosophers explain such marvels by appropriate natural causes. But common folk, not knowing of causes, believe these phenomena are produced by a miracle of God, which is usually not true, unquote. In other words, for Christians, the default explanation of events is natural causes, not the miraculous. That's why the Catholic Church, for example, does not declare purported miracles of saints to be worthy of belief until it has excluded the likelihood of natural explanations. So this brings us back to the crucial theological distinction between primary and secondary causality. I think the failure to grasp this distinction is one of the main reasons some people see a conflict between science and religion. This distinction is most simply explained, I think, by a simple analogy and by using the terms vertical and horizontal cause rather than primary and secondary cause. The analogy is to a play or a novel. Consider the play Hamlet. The character in the play Hamlet, the character Hamlet kills the character Polonius, who has been hiding behind a curtain eavesdropping, by stabbing him through, a, through the curtain. So consider the following question. Why did Polonius die? What was the cause? Did Polonius die because Hamlet stabbed him through the curtain? Or did Polonius die because Shakespeare wrote the play that way? <laughs> it's a ridiculous question. <laughs> it's a ridiculous question. They're both correct. It's absurd to be forced to choose between those, as if they're alternatives somehow, and exclude each other. They're both true. Both Hamlet and Shakespeare are causes of Polonius's death, but at different levels. Hamlet and his stabbing of Polonius is the cause within the plot of the play of Polonius's death, what one could call the horizontal cause, where Shakespeare is the vertical cause of the whole play and its entire plot, including, of course, Polonius's death. Shakespeare is the cause of there being a play, of its containing the characters it does, including Hamlet and Polonius, of all the events of the play, including the stabbing of Polonius, and of all the relationships among those characters and events, including the various causal relationships within the plot, including the stabbing causing Polonius to die. There is no competition or conflict between these two levels of causality, the horizontal and the vertical. Indeed, the horizontal depends on the vertical. By analogy, the natural causes within the universe, within its plot, which are studied by everybody, including scientists, are horizontal causes, which theology traditionally calls secondary causes, while God, as the author of nature, is the vertical or primary cause. The analogy makes clear just how silly it is to treat evolution and creation as alternatives, as both fundamentalists and atheists do. Did this species of animal arise by natural processes or because God wrote nature's plot that way? Both. By the way, this has always been the Catholic view. For example, a few years after Darwin's origin of species appeared, St. John Henry Newman, are considered by many the greatest Catholic theologian of the 19th century, argued that it was in no way contrary to theism. This, he wrote this, I think, four years after or The Origin of Species was published. He said, if secondary causes are conceivable, an almighty agent being supposed, I do not see why the series of such causes should not last for millions of years as for thousands. This also makes clear why scientific materialists are wrong to think that theists believe, quote, without evidence. For a materialist, evidence means either directly observing something with our senses or 
inferring that something exists as the natural cause of what we observe. And so, for example, we observe directly with our senses a compass needle, but we infer the existence of something we call the magnetic field as the natural cause of the movement of the compass needle. Now, obviously, God cannot be seen in either of these ways, for he's not a part of nature which could be sensed, nor a natural cause within the universe. And yet God is a cause, the ultimate cause. He is not a cause within nature, but the cause of nature. Thus, nature gives evidence of God in the same way that a play or novel gives evidence of its author, even if the author does not make an appearance within the plot, within the book. In the same way that a piece of music testifies to the existence of a composer, even if the composer is not to be found located within the notes of the music. Now let's return to the materialist historical critique of religion. The idea that Christianity and the Catholic Church in particular opposed science and tried to hold it back is called by historians of science the conflict thesis. It has been rejected by contemporary historians of science unanimously as a myth, as a recent invention. The idea that science was born in conflict with religion and that there were two warring camps, the religious camp and the scientific camp, is projecting onto the past ideas that arose in the late 19th century. In the first few centuries of modern science, the scientific people, the scientists, were almost entirely religious themselves. So there were not two camps at all. Consider the great figures of the scientific revolution. Virtually all were devout Christians. Copernicus, whose work sparked that revolution, was an official of the Catholic Church. Johannes Kepler, famous for his three laws of planetary motion, was a devout Lutheran who announced his discoveries with this prayer. I thank you, Lord God, our creator, that you have allowed me to see the beauty in your work of creation. Galileo, despite his troubles with the church, remained a devout Catholic throughout his life. In fact, when he was old and could no longer walk, he had himself carried to church to attend mass. Descartes believed in God and that human beings possess immaterial spiritual souls and professed himself a sincere Catholic. Blaise Pascal was not only a mathematician and physicist of genius, but a Catholic whose life had been transformed by a mystical experience and who wrote in defense of Christian faith against religious skepticism. Robert Boyle, the first modern chemist and founder of chemistry, often called the father of chemistry, was a pious Anglican who said that he liked to do experiments on Sunday especially because they're a form of worship. And Isaac Newton, the greatest of them all, spent as much time on theological and scriptural studies as he did on science, as he did on mathematics and physics. All of them saw their work as showing the beauty of God's creation rather than as supporting atheism. And I list at the bottom other, this is basically a who's who of 17th century scientists. And that was the century of the scientific revolution. Every one of them was a devout Christian, Catholic or Protestant. And this is true well beyond the 17th century. For example, the two greatest physicists of the 19th century, most physicists would say, were Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell. And they were both deeply devout Protestant Christians. Moreover, the scientific revolution did not spring from thin air. Its foundations were laid in the universities of medieval Europe, as has been strongly emphasized by the distinguished historian of science, Edward Grant, who is not a Catholic, not a, not a Christian, not a believer, I don't think. It was in those medieval universities, which were Catholic institutions, of course, that for the first time in human history, 
Science was studied and taught on a continuous basis from generation to generation by a stable community of scholars. That is where science was first institutionalized, as Professor Grant put it. By the end of the Middle Ages, there were 100 univers about 100 universities in Europe, and they had produced hundreds of thousands, they produced hundreds of thousands of graduates who were introduced to scientific questions and from whose ranks scientific talent could emerge. The scientific community and scientific public these universities created were the soil in which the seeds of the scientific revolution could germinate. A little known fact that dramatically illustrates the positive role the Catholic Church has played in the development of science is the large number of Catholic priests who made major discoveries. I have only time to mention a few of the most outstanding. From, I'm going to give you a, a litany, but it's not a litany of saints, it's a litany of scientists. <laughs> From the 17th century, I'll mention only Stenson or Steno, Mersenne, Scheiner, Riccioli, Grimaldi, Castelli, and Cavalieri. So Neil Stenson, also known by Latinized version of his name, Steno, is famous for, in three branches of science, anatomy, crystallography, and geology. The greatest anatomist of his time, he made major discoveries about the glandular and lymphatic system, as well as about the heart and the brain. A number of parts of the human body are named after him, Stenson's duct and Stenson's foramina and Stenson's vein, for example. But his greatest achievement was developing the theory of sedimentary rocks and the origin of fossils, which unlocked the history of the earth and for which he is regarded as one of the principal founders, really the first founder of the science of geology. The, he became, a, he was born, he was a Dan, Danish Lutheran by birth and upbringing, but he converted to Catholicism and became a priest and was eventually made a bishop. Known for his rigorous asceticism and concern for the poor, he was declared blessed by Pope John Paul II. Marin Mersenne, a friar of the Minimite order, is considered the founder of acoustics, along with uh, Galileo, for fundamental discoveries in the theory of sound and vibrations. For example, he was the first to measure the speed of sound. He also made important contributions to the theory and design of reflecting telescopes. His most important contribution, however, was as an organizer, really, of the scientific community. His religious house became a meeting place of famous scientists, like Descartes and Pascal and so on. And his voluminous correspondence with other scientists was an important means by which scientists learned of each other's work. Back in those days, there, wasn't, there weren't scientific conferences. There weren't scientific journals. There was not the internet. How did scientists learn of each other's work? Through correspondence. And really, Descartes, uh, not Descartes, uh, uh, Mersenne, was the center of that web of communication. That's why the Dictionary of Scientific Biography calls him one of the, quote, architects of the European scientific community. Christoph Scheiner, a, a Jesuit astronomer, was one of the uh, discoverers of sunspots and made the most detailed studies of them. There's a picture of him in his observatory. Um, the Jesuit astronomer Giovanni Battista Riccioli developed an extensive star catalog developed methods for measuring time precisely in experiments, and together with his fellow Jesuit, Francesco Grimaldi, made the first map of the moon's surface. Most remarkably, Riccioli discovered and discussed in detail the effect in physics that we call the Coriolis effect, 200, two centuries before Coriolis. His collaborator, his colleague, Francesco Grimaldi, made a much even greater discovery in physics. He discovered the extremely important physics phenomenon of diffraction, the diffraction of light. And he made careful studies of diffraction patterns. It's also he who named the phenomenon diffraction. This fundamental discovery shows that light is a wave. It was, that was not realized until 150 years later. Since we now know that all matter is made of, up of waves, diffraction is a very important phenomenon in all branches of physics. Whether you take an undergraduate physics course, a freshman physics course, 
where there'll be a whole chapter in your textbook on diffraction, or take graduate courses in physics where there'll also be chapters on diffraction in your textbook. The Benedictine priest, Benedetto Castelli, was a friend and student of Galileo. He did foundational work in hydraulics and fluid mechanics. His much more famous student, Torricelli, discovered the principle of the barometer and was the first to correctly explain the causes of wind. Bon Bonaventura, I misspelled his first name, Bonaventura Cavalieri, another student of Castelli and himself a priest, made important advances in the development of integral calculus. Calculus, as you know, was in independently discovered by Newton and Leibniz. And there's a quote from Leibniz himself paying tribute to the contributions of Cavalieri. He said, in the sublimest of geometry, meaning he was talking about uh, integral calculus, the, the initiators and promoters who performed a yeoman's task were Cavalieri and Torricelli, later others, meaning himself, progressed uh, uh, even further using their work. One of the greatest uh, biologists of the 18th century was Lozaro Spallanzani. His contributions were too numerous to mention. Um, the René Just Oui, who lived at the time of the French Revolution, is one of the founders of crystallography. He discovered the fundamental mathematical rules governing crystal structure. Actually, he had a theory based on the existence of atoms and the crystals were ba made of layers of atoms that allowed him to explain mathematically the angles made uh, by crystal you know, faces. So he's considered the founder of crystallography. In the 19th century, Father Giuseppe Piazzi made many contributions to astronomy, including discovering the first asteroid, Ceres. Actually, when he discovered it, he called it a planet. And then it was reclassified decades later as an, when they discovered asteroids as an asteroid. But in recent years, uh, the astronomers have reclassified it as a planet because it really is a planet, not an asteroid. <laughs> well, it, it's actually, well, in going to, it actually is. It, it has a different origin from the asteroids. It wandered into the asteroid belt. And also, it's the only one in the asteroid belt who's big enough that its self-gravitation squeezes it into the shape of a sphere. So it really is a planet. But anyway, um, that's here, neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, the Jesuit priest Angelo Secchi is considered one of the main founders of modern astrophysics. Astronomy, before the 19th century, astronomy is concerned with where things are in the sky and how they move in the sky. But astrophysics it goes deeper. Astrophysics asks, what are stars? What are they made of? What produces their light? And so it's, it, what is the physics behind all of this? And ast one of the prime techniques that astrophysics has always used is, is the spectra of the light coming from stars and the sun. And the pioneer in that, the person who pioneered the use of spectroscopy to study the sun and stars was Angelo Secchi. So he's considered one of the founders of astrophysics. In fact, his, he was the first person to classify stars on the basis of their spectra. And his classification was the basis of the one that's used today. So he, his was used up until one was developed at Harvard, which was more sophisticated, but basically uh, built upon his. And that's the one that's used today. A beautiful symbol of the harmony between faith and science is that Secchi did some, um, his groundbreaking research using an observatory that he had built on the roof of a beautiful church, the, the Jesuit church in Rome, St. Saint Ignatius, the Church of St. Ignatius. The, the telescope is no longer there, but, but there's a picture of it when it was there. The Czech priest, and I'm almost at the end, Bernard Bolzano, uh, helped put modern mathematics on a more rigorous foundation. Anyone who has studied the foundations of calculus has heard of the bolzano weierstrass theorem, for example. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called him an outstanding mathematician and perhaps the greatest logician in the period between, from Leibniz to Frege. That's a 200-year period. So he, was a, he is considered one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century. And then there's the Austrian monk Gregor Mendel, who founded the science of genetics. And last but not least is the priest that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, Georges Lemaitre a Belgian theoretical physicist, mathematician, and Catholic priest who was the one who proposed the Big Bang Theory. 
So the central pillar of our understanding of the universe and its evolution is a theory that was proposed by a Catholic priest scientist. Okay, in fact, um, recently the, uh, the, the law that, that describes the expansion of the universe is called Hubble's law traditionally, but recently the members of the International Astronomical Union voted overwhelmingly to recommend that the famous Hubble law just be renamed the Hubble Lemaitre law. It was actually Lemaitre predicted it before Hubble actually observed it. That is a glorious record of achievement. Uh, Professor Lawrence Principe of Johns Hopkins University, a leading historian of science, has written that, the, quote, the Catholic Church has been probably the largest single, largest single and longest term patron of science in history. Okay. For reasons of time, I won't, I'm skipping the whole part on Galileo. Now, in the last, I, I hope I've shown you that the record of the Catholic Church and Christianity in general with regard to science is not something to be embarrassed about, but actually something quite glorious, something to be celebrated. In the last part of my talk, I'd like to mention some recent, some discoveries of modern physics that seem more in line with a Christian view of the world than with materialism and atheism. I'm going to skip, not going to show you that quote yet. Um, for an in-depth discussion, I refer you to my book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, where I go into a lot of, of the physics, but in an accessible way. One discovery has to do with the beginning of the universe. The Jewish and Christian view was that the universe had a temporal beginning. By contrast, the pagan philosophers of antiquity, including Aristotle, believe that the universe has always existed for infinite time. And most modern atheists have preferred that idea as well. Now, as of 100 years ago, the scientific evidence seemed to point to the uh, say that the universe had always existed for infinite time. And many people came to regard the idea of a temporal beginning as just religious mythology. But now we know that Father Georges Lemaitre's idea of a Big Bang was correct. There was a Big Bang about 14 billion years ago. In the standard theory of cosmology, that was the beginning of the universe and of time itself. Now, it is quite possible that something existed before the Big Bang, and there are many speculative scenarios about what that might have been. But even if that is the case, the scientific, there are scientific arguments theoretical arguments that strongly favor the idea that the universe had a temporal beginning at some point, either at the Big Bang or at some earlier point. A second discovery has to do with our place in the universe. For a long time, atheists have said that the evidence shows that human beings are just a cosmic accident, a fluke in a universe that is totally without purpose. But over the last few decades, physicists have become increasingly aware of many features of the laws, fundamental laws of physics as we know them today and of the structure of the universe that seem to be just right to make the existence of life like us possible. If certain things had been even slightly different about the laws of physics, then we would not be here. These fortuitous features of the laws of physics and the structure of the universe are often called anthropic coincidences. They suggest to many people that we aren't just an accident and that the universe does have a purpose, namely that beings like ourselves should arise in it. And I could mention many examples of such fortuitous or anthropic features of the universe and its laws. I discuss about a dozen of them at great length in my, in my book. I'll give you just a few. If the strong force that holds nuclei together were slightly weaker, about 20 to 25% weaker than it is, almost none of the elements of the periodic table would exist except hydrogen. The same is true had a certain energy level of the carbon-12 nucleus not been very close to its actual value. If it had not been very close to its actual value, there would be virtually no carbon in the universe or elements heavier than carbon. And, uh, and so in either of those cases, we wouldn't be here. Another dr a dramatic example is the strength of the Higgs field, uh, the so-called uh, so vacuum expectation value. 
the, the strength of the Higgs field has to be tuned, really, has to lie within a very narrow range for us to, to exist, and so on. Nor is it just certain quantities that seem fine-tuned for life. Certain gross qualitative features of the universe are crucial as well. The fact that the world is quantum mechanical is very important for the possibility of life, as is the fact that there are three extended dimensions of space and not more. And I could talk about all of these things in the Q&A if you want, or privately. An interesting case is the very size of the universe. Many people have seen the vast size of the universe compared to us as proving that we are insignificant in the cosmic scheme. But actually, the vast size of the universe is a precondition for us being here. It takes billions of years for the chemical, it took billions of years for the chemical elements needed for life to be produced in stars and through various astrophysical processes to get the elements of the periodic table. And billions of years more for complex multicellular life to evolve. And according to Einstein's theory of gravity, if a universe is to be able to last for billions of years, it has to be as large as ours is. If, on the contrary, because general relativity relates the longevity of a universe to its size, if, on the contrary, the universe had a size that was of a more human scale, say thousands of miles across, it would have lasted for only about a hundredth of a second. Unless the universe were vast, we would not be here. Now, there is a naturalistic way to account for some of the anthropic coincidences, and that's called the multiverse idea. And that's a very interesting idea, and I, not, and I was going to talk about it, but I was warned that I should stay under less than an hour, so I'm going to. Uh, but I would be happy to talk about the multiverse idea in the Q&A. Um, I will say this, though. The multi, if our universe is a multiverse, and a multiverse is a type of universe, this doesn't mean there are many universes necessarily. It's a type of universe. If the universe is to be a multiverse, then it has to have very special laws. And so th I think the takeaway lesson from the anthropic coincidences is that if you want the universe, if you want a universe to have living things, and to give rise to living things, organic life, the laws of fundamental laws of physics have to be very special in one way or another. They can be special in having certain quantities fine-tuned and certain features, anthropic features that are just right for life, or they can be special in having this kind of laws the fundamental be laws being such that they give rise to a multiverse. Either way, the laws have to be very special. A third development, and I think I may stop here, is, well, no, I won't. A third development, <laughs> I have, I still have five minutes. A third development is that physicists have found the laws of physics to be based on very deep mathematical ideas. The laws of planetary motion that Kepler discovered 400 years ago are beautiful mathematically. But it's simple math, it's rather elementary math. You could explain Kepler's laws in about 15 minutes to a bright uh, middle schooler. They involve just some simple geometry and algebra. But Kepler's laws of planetary motion really are a consequence of deeper laws, namely the laws of gravity and mechanics discovered by Isaac Newton 300 years ago. To understand Newton's laws requires calculus. Newton's law of gravity, in turn, is based on yet deeper laws, namely Einstein's theory of gravity. So we go from Kepler, deeper is Newton, deeper than Newton is Einstein's theory of gravity, which was proposed about 100 years ago. To understand Einstein's laws of gravity requires a much more uh, sophisticated mathematics. You need to understand curved, four-dimensional, non-Euclidean space-time, and such things as differential geometry and tensor analysis. Usually you study that in graduate school after a whole undergraduate curriculum of math and physics. Now many physicists that now believe that Einstein's laws really come from an even deeper theory and probably from something called superstring theory, which was discovered over 40 years ago. The mathematics of superstring theory is so deep that even the army of the world's most brilliant physicists and mathematicians who've been working on this for most of those 40 years will tell you that they have not fully grasped its mathematical structure. 
Doesn't this suggest that a mind much greater than ours is at work? The more deeply physics has probed the inner workings of the physical world, the more profound and intricate the mathematical structure it has uncovered. The architecture of the physical world is not based on the mere amalgamation of simple stuff, but on mathematically rich ideas. As the great 20th century physicist James, James Jeans, Sir James Jeans remarked long ago, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. And in 1931, the great mathematician, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, Herman Weil, uh, who also made really important contributions to theoretical physics, said this in a lecture at Yale University. He said, many people think that modern science is far removed from God. I find, on the contrary, that it is much more difficult today for the knowing person to approach God from history, from the spiritual side of the world, and from morals, for there we encounter the suffering and evil in the world, which it is difficult to bring into harmony with an all-merciful and almighty God. In this domain, we have evidently not yet succeeded in raising the veil with which our human nature covers the essence of things. But in our knowledge of physical nature, we have penetrated so far that we can obtain a vision of the flawless harmony which is in conformity with sublime reason. And for him, that was the reason of God, the divine reason. And finally, and this is I'm just going to skim over this, a very, very profound discovery, uh, one of the great dis discoveries in the history of science was the discovery of quantum mechanics in the 1920s. And according to some of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, quantum mechanics implies that the human mind is not just something physical. There's more to it than can be explained by the motion of atoms governed by the laws of physics. And I'll just quote two great physicists of the 20th century. Sir Rudolf Peierls said on the basis of quantum mechanics, he said, the premise that you can describe in terms of physics, the whole function of a human being, including its knowledge and consciousness, is untenable. And the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner said that materialism, specifically the idea that human minds are just matter in motion, is, quote, inconsistent with present quantum mechanics. Now, I can't explain in a few minutes, in, in fact, uh, I don't have even a few minutes, uh, why they say this. This is an ar argument that goes back to the great mathematician John von Neumann in the 1930s. Uh, that, uh, that the logic of quantum mechanics forbids you to say that everything, including observers, uh, are entirely physical entities. Uh, so I'm not going to try to explain it to you. I I'll just make one further quote. I can talk about it in the Q&A or in private if you wish, or I refer you to a video of a, uh, on YouTube of a 40-minute talk I gave on the subject uh, at the Society of Catholic Scientists, 19 uh, 2018 meeting. Let me quote a very distinguished philosopher of physics, Professor Hans Halverson of Princeton University. He said, in the case of quantum mechanics, if one presupposes physicalism, that is the idea that everything is physical, one quickly lands in the measurement problem. That's a, a deep problem of quantum mechanics. Okay, so let me end where I started. Not only has religion, and Christianity in particular, including Catholic Christianity, been a great friend of science and played a very positive role in its history. But the things discovered by science, contrary to what many people think, have actually in many ways tended to agree with some fundamental religious ideas about the universe and our place in it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barr, for really talking about the relationship between science and religion, but even more so, the, I think you used the word harmony between the two. I think that's a great way of talking about the two. Um, so we'll take questions from students, but before that, I just want to ask, where did your interest in this even begin? Because we have students who go to the lab and then come to church, but how did you decide to meld the two in your own research? Well, it's not in my research, but I've, I've always been interested in how things fit together. and. Um, so I, I'm not contentious. Well, in physics, 
I'm interested in how the, uh, how the different uh, forces of nature fit together. That's what grand unified theories tried to do, is give you a unified picture of the different forces. But I don't want to just see how things fit together in, in physics. I want to see how the things I know from my faith and the things I know from science fit together. And ever since I was a teenager, I've thought very hard about these things. Um, and over the decades, thought very hard about it. And um, it's only in recent years, well, actually the last 25, that sort of serendipitously I ended up writing about these things. But it was mostly because I don't want to have a sort of bifurcated mind where you know, I have this knowledge and this knowledge and they have nothing to do with each other and no relation. That doesn't make sense. We live in one world, one reality, created by one God, so everything must be in harmony with everything else. So um, that's how I got to think, just for my own intellectual satisfaction. So I guess you're supposed to come up to the mic and, and ask questions, as I'm told the procedure. <clears throat> There's a lot of physics I'd love to talk about. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Barr, for the uh, very, is the mic working? Yeah. Um, for the very interesting talk. I had a question that actually, um, you kind of touched upon it just in the quote right at the end here from Professor Halverson. So yeah. I suppose it's a bit of an expansion, but you talked about a couple of experimental results that you suggested maybe cohere better with say, a theistic account of the world than, you know, a materialistic or secular, let's say, account of the world. And I'm curious as to whether or not you think that there are kind of more banal or everyday methodological phenomena in physics that also uh, arrive at or suggest similar conclusions, right? So with the Halverson quote, for example, I assume the idea is something like, you know, if we take a collapse interpretation of quantum mechanics, then there's a there's content to the formalism that exceeds, you know, the physical reference of measurement, for example. Um, but it seems to me that there are other examples like this, right? So mm -hmm. if we, for example, talk about Hamiltonian mechanics, right, we often see quantification over possible but non-actual states of affairs, right? Or even, you know, to get very esoteric, I, and I'm, I'm non-technical, so I might get this wrong, but I read a paper that Ed Witten wrote one time where he talked about, um, you know, he said something very kind of offhandedly along the lines of, well, you know, we get space-time geometry by kind of like quantifying over every possible... Well, quantizing, well, what you might mean. No. Well, he was, he was saying that we get like the large scale structure oh, okay. of space time by kind of like averaging over oh. uh, every possible like Minkowski and manifold or something like that. Um, and, and so the idea, the broad idea I'm getting at, I guess, is it seems like the notion of invoking kind of non-physical things in the, the formalisms that we need for describing physical phenomena is much more at home in on a theistic picture than a materialistic one that can't really account for how we can make reference to things that aren't themselves physical in our theories? That's a big question. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't thought about it in precisely those terms, so I'm not, uh, maybe at a loss, but except to say that um, it is true that the, the laws of physics, take quantum mechanics and what maybe Witten was talking about there, um, one way to understand quantum mechanics is that um, this is actually, it's going to get too long and technical for the Q&A, so maybe, but I will say this, that uh, it is certainly true that, that the laws of physics are, involve very abstract entities, okay? So um, you can't, uh, you, the irony is that, that in understanding just matter, you can't really, un, you don't understand it in, through modern physics except through a very, very high level of abstraction. And you're talking about um, things that have no obvious connection to our everyday experience. I mean, just take a very simple example. Uh, quantum mechanics is, uh, inherently makes use of complex numbers or you know, square root of minus one. And for a century after people, mathematicians studied that, they, they thought that had no relevance to the real world. It was just purely a mathematician's uh, mathematical concept. But it turns out that in the history of mathematics uh, and physics, what's happened is that many beautiful mathematical ideas, highly abstract ones, that, had, that were thought to have no relevance to the physical world, 
and had been studied and developed by mathematicians solely because they were beautiful mathematically, it turned out to be essential for formulating the theories of modern physics, and give example after example of that. Um, and so th this is very strange, and actually uh, physicists and mathematicians have, have remarked on this, is that the most beautiful mathematics, which, which very, very far seemingly removed from the physical world, turned out to be essential in describing the physical world. And so I don't know if that's getting right at what you're saying, but I just thought it was worth mentioning anyway. <laughs> Uh, I was hoping you would ask me about the quote by Halverson so I could explain what I hadn't, didn't have time to explain in my talk. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Barr. Hello, April. Um, <laughs> great talk. <laughs> um, I was hoping that you could expand a little bit more on the multiverse and the anthropic coincidences. Okay. By the way, I have on my slides just to show you that this isn't just religious people talking about this, I want to just uh, to show you that uh, it used to be taboo of 20 or 30 years ago to even talk about anthropic coincidences in this physics technical literature. It was a sure way to get yourself labeled as some kind of a kook, perhaps. However, it's now become accepted that there are such coincidences. And, and uh, let me quote um, Stephen Hawking, who was an atheist, as we all know, and in his last book, 2010, he said, what can we make of these coincidences? Our universe and its laws appear to have a design that both is tailor-made to support us, and if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. That's not easily explained, and it raises some natural, the natural question of why it is that way. And then I also quote Ed Witten, who was just referred to, who is considered the greatest phys theoretical physicist alive, and he also says, uh, and there is a second level of, this is Witten, a second level of puzzlement about why the laws of physics proved uh, to have such delicate properties. The laws of nature are very delicate, just with the physics we already know, the fact that galaxies, stars, and planets roughly like ours could have formed, and that living things roughly like us could have formed, depends on many details of the laws of physics as we currently know them, being just the way they are and not being slightly different. Now, he describes himself as a skeptical agnostic. So this is not a religious idea. This is an idea that has emerged in physics, and many people who are not religious take them very seriously. Now, what is the multiverse idea? So there are all these, let's take the case of fine tunings, for example, that certain parameters like this, the uh, strength of the Higgs field and the strength of the strong force and various other things seem to have to be just as they are, not bigger or smaller, but just the way they are or very close to the way they are in order for us to be here. The multiverse idea um, explains this as follows, or at least explains some of these things as follows. It says, these features that are so, that have just the right values, these quantities have just the right values to enable life to exist, are not constants of nature. They're not the same throughout the whole universe. So take the strength of the strong force. It actually varies from place to place in the universe. The vacuum, well, the, the value of the Higgs field varies from place to place, and so on. The, uh, um, and now they can't vary within the part of the universe we can see because we can tell that they aren't different billions of light years away. As far as we can see with telescopes, we see that these quantities have the same values far away as they do here. But the idea is the universe is exponentially larger than the part we can see. And there's very strong reasons to believe that. The universe is vastly bigger than even the part we can see. And in those places beyond our horizon, these quantities take different values. And the idea is it becomes a kind of cosmic lottery. All these quantities take different values in different parts of the universe, and the universe is so big that there's bound to be some regions of the universe where all of them take just the right values to make life possible. So you buy enough lottery tickets, one of them's gonna pay off. That's the idea. Now, in order for, to have a multiverse, so, so, so a multiverse is basically a universe in which very, various Im fundamental parameters, important parameters, vary from place to place. In order to have a universe like that, the fundamental laws of physics, because the way physicists would understand a multiverse is that deep down there's a set of fundamental laws that applies everywhere. 
but those fundamental laws would have to have an amazing amount of flexibility to them, such as to allow th these various quantities to vary from place to place. So for example, the mass of the electron wouldn't just be one thing, it would be different here and in other regions of the universe. And that requires the laws of fundamental laws to have a remarkable degree of flexibility to them. And that's what I say, they have to be very special. If you want a multiverse, the fundamental laws have to be very special. And if you don't have a multiverse, then they have to be special because then you have to fine tune all these parameters to get life. But either way, you need special laws. And as Witten says, when he talks about this, he says, I think we'll never resolve the sense of wonder about that. In other words, it's amazing that the laws of physics are such that they allow life to exist. We should not take that for granted. It's, an, it's a remarkable thing about the laws of physics, as Ed Witten points out. I guess that's all I have probably done to say. Yeah. Any? <clears throat> Thank you again, Dr. Barr, for coming and speaking to us. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about one thing you said early on in the talk, which is that you don't see incompatibility with, please correct me if I'm kind of remembering you wrong, but okay. maybe Catholic religion specifically in teaching and science. One thing that comes to my mind is uh, the Catholic practice of Eucharist and transubstantiation. Um, I'm at the Div school here. I am a Catholic. It's not a Catholic divinity school. so talking about Eucharist and why I believe in transubstantiation comes up a fair bit. Okay. Um, and I never, I never attempt to answer that scientifically. Right. Um, is that Nor a question you. that you get a lot? And what no, do you think actually, about that? No, actually, this is the first time I've ever got that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. But you see, uh, there's, no con there's not a contradiction, because what the Catholic doctrine says, really, is that in any, by all empirical, so, you know, in the, in the language that was used tr traditionally, you know, the, sub uh, the substance is that of, becomes a substance of the body of Christ and, and the blood of Christ, but the accidents remain. Okay, stripped of that sort of Aristotelian terminology, what the Catholic teaching really is saying is that by any empirical test, the consecrated elements still are, behave in every way like bread and wine. Not just they taste like bread and wine, they look like bread and wine, but if you put them in a mass spectrometer, they would behave like bread and wine. If you weighed them and you do any scientific test, any empirical test, they will act entirely like bread and wine. And yet what they are, in some mysterious way, is the body and blood of Christ. So Christ is really present. But that doesn't conflict with science because it's saying that any empirical test you do to them is going to give you what... Uh, uh, they'd act like bread and wine. So if, if the teaching was that, oh, um, that if you do certain tests, you know, some su subtle particle physics test, or you irradiate it with something, or you just put it in an accelerator and bounce particles off of it or something, it's going to act different. <laughs> Once the priest consecrates the bread and wine, suddenly there'll be a measurable difference. If that's what the church was teaching, then you would have a severe risk of contradicting science because I think uh, if you put, did those tests, it wouldn't have show a measurable difference. So, but that's not what the church says. So I think there's no problem scientifically. There's still the mystery there, which we could talk about, but it's not a scientific problem. Hi, Dr. Barr, thank you very much. Um, sort of along those lines, I'm curious what your definition of a miracle is then. Well, actually there's different definitions and, and, and uh, different people give different definitions. So the way I defined it is, well, first of all, what miracles are called in the Bible are signs and wonders. And the word miracle comes from the Latin for amazement. So it's a, so it's a wonder. And so um, the traditional idea is that, is, first of all, um, the traditional idea is that it is something that is out of the ordinary course of things. It's not something that happens ordinarily. It's extraordinary. And it's the kind of thing that produces astonishment and wonder. So turning water into wine, it doesn't happen in the course of nature, and it would produce astonishment. Transubstantiation is not considered traditionally in the Catholic Church as a miracle because it doesn't produce wonder. Why? Because there's no 
uh, you don't, there's nothing you sense. Uh, it has to be something you can see happening, like turning water into wine. But you, no one goes into a, an atheist goes into a Catholic church, he's not going to be struck dumb with wonder at the transubstantiation because there's nothing empirically there that astonishes him. So, um, but so I, the way I talked about it in my talk is that it is something that is beyond, um, it's an extraordinary event beyond what could naturally happen. And, um, but that's not enough because it's also a sign. So in, in the Bible, God doesn't do miracles just to uh, amaze people. He also does not, the miracles have not done in salvation history to convince atheists to believe in God. All the miracles Jesus performed were in the sight of devout Jews, and a few Romans here and there. But basically, he performed these miracles in the sight of people who already believed in God. They are not to convince people to believe in God. They're, to, they're, they're signs uh, usually of divine, uh, signs of God's love. And they're signs that somebody is speaking sort of but with divine authority or teaching with divine authority or acting in behalf of God. So the fact that Moses or some prophet has some, uh, at, the, at the behest of Moses or a prophet or, a miracle or an apostle or a miracle is done by God means that God is with that person. It's a sign of God's, uh, that that person is speaking or acting on behalf of God. So it's a sign of that, also of God's love. Uh, so when God, when Christ cures someone of illness, it's, it's showing that God cares about us uh, and has the power. Also, it's a sign that God has power over nature and therefore can save us. Because if God didn't have power over nature, he couldn't save us from death. You know, he couldn't rescue us from the power of death. So that's my answer to what a miracle is. Yeah. Sorry for a quick follow-up yeah. then. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the canonization with the yeah. church, to, to proclaim something a miracle, I guess, is there any sense of um, breaking a, a law of nature or going at contrary to nature in order to allow for that um, descriptor? It, it does not have, is? miracles don't have to violate the law of nature, uh, but some of them I think clearly do or almost certainly do. So, for example, uh, the miraculous catch of fish that are reported in two of the Gospels, you know, where, now that's, it was miraculous, uh, but it didn't violate the law of nature that suddenly there were a lot of fish there when Jesus said, you right. know, thrown. Um, another example of something that wouldn't violate the law of nature, it's, this one is, is probably didn't actually happen, but legend has it that it happened, is that when the scholars in Alexandria were translating, before the time of Christ, were translating the books of the Old Testament into Greek to form what's called the Septuagint. Uh, they, the, the, the story goes that the king, or whoever it was, appointed 70 or 72 scholars to independently translate the Hebrew into Greek, and lo and behold, they all came up with a word for word exactly the same translation. Well, that doesn't violate the law of physics, but it would be certainly, if it happened, miraculous. But there's some miracles like turning water into wine, or um, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, that it, one would be hard pressed to explain those, uh, to, 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 uh, for the, to see how those could happen without violating a law of physics. Maybe violating, theologians get mad when you, they say violate the laws. They do not, they are not in accord <laughs> with the laws of physics. <laughs> God isn't yeah. violating. If, if the lawgiver decides to suspend the law, maybe it's not like he's a lawbreaker. He decides to suspend the law. But there are certain miracles. Now, if you're really clever, you can think of ways that those could have been done without violating the laws of physics. But you really, the, the, what you come up with is so weird and ridiculous that I think it's just easier to say that God violated the laws of physics. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Dr. Hi. Barr, thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about experience. So um, you've obviously <clears throat> spoken about it in the beginning as well about, um, I believe it was uh, supernatural and materialist um, uh -huh. <clears throat> kind of positions. So as a, a scholar and an intellectual professor, how do you navigate being someone who does believe in God and who's religious? Um, uh, whilst also being, you know, an academic who who's conceived as being rational, um, but believing in religion, which is kind of 
a lot to a lot of people seen as irrational considering there's no evidence I'm of having God. a dip by thinking that those people are wrong but <laughs> to <laughs> see it. <laughs> and that is I don't think it is irrational there's just nothing irrational about there being a God who's the creator mm -hmm. of all things I mean um, so I, I don't see the irrationality there. But what has your experience been in terms of how people have related? Well, how people react to you? Yeah, and relate now, to as you. As I always say, I don't know how that. people act behind my back, what they say <laughs> about me behind my back, and maybe I don't want to know. Um, I was always very, um, because I'm kind of a, a coward, when I was young, I, t I didn't, um, I, maybe I was just being prudent. I, I didn't, I wasn't very open, certainly with people, professors about my religious beliefs. Mm. Fellow students, grad students, there's no problem. But I, I, but, um, I it's really, one, once I became quite established in my field and everybody knew I was a good scientist, you know, and, uh, and then, then it, the fact when they found out I'm religious, it didn't change their evaluation of me as a scientist. Mm. Uh, so I, I think, um, I'm not giving advice to other people because everybody's in a different situation. I think you have to be, if you're a young person and you're Catholic, and you, you have to be careful that you know who you're dealing with uh, before you're too open about your faith. I'll tell you a little anecdote. My thesis advisor at Princeton was a very, you know, quite an eminent physicist named Tony Z. And Tony Z, I knew uh, when I was his grad student at Princeton, his younger brother, Charlie Z, was a fellow grad student in another department, and I used to pal around with, he was part of my circle of friends. So I knew things about Tony through him, and he knew things about me through his younger brother. But um, Tony uh, was a Chinese, ra born in China, raised in Hong Kong, and then Brazil, and he came from a very devout Catholic family. And at some point he lapsed, I believe. Though I think he still believes in God. At least he said things that in his books, one thing in his book that suggests he still believes in God. But he, I don't, he's, a, he's not a Catholic, as far as I know, anymore. And so once at a cocktail party, when I was a postdoc, he said to me, so Steve, he knew I was Catholic, I think, through his younger brother. So he, he said, Steve, when was the last time you went to Mass? And I think he expected me to say, oh, when I was 15, and then I lo <clears throat> lost my faith. And the answer was last Sunday. But I didn't want to say that because your thesis advisor is very important for your career. <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes a person who's lost a lapsed Catholic might be very anti-Catholic sometimes. That is, they not only leave the faith, but they're bitter, mm -hmm. you know. And, and sometimes lapsed Catholics can be the most anti- And I, what, I didn't know what his attitude was. And I, I thought if he's bitterly anti-Catholic and I tell him I'm a Catholic, he could affect his perception of me. So I, I didn't answer, I deflected his question. Mm. And then every time at mass, the reading would come up, if you deny me before men, I will, <laughs> I will deny you before my father in heaven. And I would, you know, I'd sit there and say, I am in deep blank. <laughs> I am basically, uh, I'm in deep trouble here. And then I would rationalize it, as people always do. I would say, well, Jesus said we must be wise as serpents. <laughs> right? So you have to be smart, I thought. So. And interestingly enough, many years, 30 years later, I, got, I started corresponding with a young fellow uh, who was an, an, an assistant professor at a large Midwestern university in the biology department. And he's a convert from, Jew, from a Jewish background. I won't say his name. And he said, boy, there's some really anti-religious people in my department. And when we're having, you know, over the coffee machine, they're making really nasty remarks about religion, and I have to bite my tongue. Mm. And he said, but I guess we must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He said to me, I said, aha, that's exactly what I used to say when I was his age. Uh, but, you know, you have to evaluate your own situation. But, um, um, yeah, I've never f encountered hostility except twice in 40-something years of my professional life, only two times that some fellow scientist acted actually in a hostile way to me. Mm -hmm. Generally, I, they treat, they, I think they, most scientists, even ones who are not religious, most of them are, are, are cool with it. I mean, they're, uh, they, they respect it, mm -hmm. you know. There are very few, I think, who are sort of so anti-religious that they think you're an idiot if you're mm. religious. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah. So what I'll take from that is don't tell anyone. Just keep it secret. <laughs> well, be careful. Be careful. Anyway, all right. Oh, let's see. Do I? Let me take my uh, thumb drive here before I forget. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Barr, for joining us tonight. I think that was a wonderful conversation and great questions to hear about. I just want to invite everyone next Sunday for our final lecture of the semester, where Eduardo Penalver, the president of Seattle University, will speak at the Calabrese Fellowship in Faith and Law. Thank you to everyone, and have a good evening.